Um, I'm Mary Carr. I'm obviously not Terrence Hayes. And I thought what I would do is start um, by reading a Terrence Hayes poem. Let me see if I can liberate this sucker, get all Elvis with it. Um, I thought what I'd do is start by reading a poem of Terrence's. Um, I've been a fan of his for a long time since, since uh, like, who isn't? But um, because this poem has Sylvia Plath in I thought I'd start by reading his poem. Um, it's called, surprisingly enough, American Sonnet for My Past and Future Assassin. The black poet would love to say his century began with Hughes or, God forbid, Wheatley. But actually, it began with all the poetry weirdos and war warriors, warriors, poetry whiners and winos falling from ship bows, sunset bridges and windows. In a second, I'll tell you how little writing rescues. My hunch is that Sylvia Plath was not especially fun company. <laughs> a drama queen, thin-skinned and skittery, she thought her poems were ordinary. What do you call a visionary who does not recognize her vision? Orpheus was alone when he invented writing. His manic drawing became a kind of writing when he sent his beloved a sketch of an eye with an X struck through it. He meant, I am blind without you. She thought he meant, I never want to see you again. It is possible he meant that too. He could read it better because he's taller, but God damn it, I'm determined. <laughs> I'm going to get down low and go underhanded and see what I can do. Um, I hate to start with such a bummer of a poem, but uh, it's a, it's a, it's a poem that's haunted me because it's a story that's haunted me because nothing's worse than uh, than having having a kid die by her own hand, and uh, one of my best friends sort of went through that. So, just so you know, the the it's, this is called the Burning Girl, but the girl doesn't actually set herself on fire. It, it's it's a metaphor. So, the Burning Girl. While the tennis ball went back and forth in time. A girl was burning. While the tonic took its greeny acid lime, a girl was burning. While the ruby sun fell from a cloud's bent claws, and Wimbledon was won and lost, we sprawled along the shore in chairs. We breathed the azure air alongside a girl with the thinnest arms, all scarred and scored with marks she'd made herself. She sat with us in flames that not all saw or saw but couldn't say at risk of seeming impolite. And later, we all thought of the monk who doused himself with gas and lit a match and then sat unmoving amid devouring light. She didn't speak. She touched no aspect of our silly selves. We were a herd of hardly troubled rich. She was an almost ghost her mother saw erasing the edges of herself each day, smudging the lines like charcoal while her parents redrew her into being over and again each night and dawn and sleepless all years long. Having seen that mother's love, I testify it was ocean endless. One drop could have brought to life the deadest Christ. And she emptied herself into that blazing child with all her might and stared a hundred million miles into the girl's slender, dwindling shape. Her father was the king of helicopter pad and putting green. His baby burned, and we all watched in disbelief. I was the facile friend insisting on a hug who hadn't been along for years of doctors, wards, and protocols. I forced her sadness close. I said, come on, let's hug it out. Her arms were white birch twigs that scissored stiffly at my neck till she slid on. That night we watched some fireworks on the dewy lawn, for it was Independence Day. By morning, she was gone. 
She was the flaming tower we all dared to jump from, so she burned. Um, one of my favorite poets is a guy named Dean Young. He and Terrence are going to mud wrestle someday for my love, and we'll decide who's, who's entirely worthy. Um, uh, but Dean, uh, Dean's heart died, like died, like literally died, and he uh, had to get it, wait for a human, human to die so he could have some little boy's heart in his chest. And uh, this poem is called The Organ Donor's Driver's License Has a Black Check. I think I'll read this and then I'll sit down and make T say something. Forgive me, black ant, at the base of my yoga mat. If the Buddhists are right and you had a soul, I'm a killer. And you, young deer, who swayed neck through the rifle scope I might otherwise have stroked. Forgive me, juicy burger, medium rare. I fell off the vegan wagon for want of you. I devoured your iron to fuel my weak blood. Jet lagged, I slumped and felt your sacrifice worthy. How did you go? A bolt through the skull and your big corpus on the blood gel floor of the abattoir. Countless ducks flying their arrowheads across the gray sky found their emerald necks in my bird dog's mouth. I liked what Dean said to the squirrel we found thrashing on the path. Thrashing on the path off the quad, he stopped to look down. His lips were blue from his failing heart, as if he'd eaten nothing but bomb pops for a week. Some beast must have crunched down on the squirrel's neck, and Dean bent like a waiter to say, sans irony, I honor your struggle, little brother. And with that, I'll introduce Terrence. See why I want to do this with Mary, because she's she can do it better than I can. Is this thing on? I don't know if it's on. Can you hear me? Oh yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I, I'm gonna just talk into it. Uh, it's good to be here. Glad to be here with Mary. Um, I really want to talk, you know, just because uh, I mean with her, because I read these. I've been reading these poems everywhere, so I'm sick of them. I keep trying to figure out some way to do something different with it. So this, too, will be something different. Um, and then we'll talk, which is really what I want to do you know, about those couple of poems you just read. All right, uh, what I think I'm going to do is, you know, like in the index, now it feels so phallic up in my face like that. It's just, <laughs> maybe I'll hold it. I'll hold it. I'll just hold it. Yeah, you got, because otherwise it's yeah, just yeah. not right for you. Right. Um, it's less phallic. Um, so the index has, because they all have the same title, so the index has kind of almost poems. They almost sound like poems. I don't want them to sound too much like poems. But what I think I'll do is just like read a section, like the opposite of a crown. So read like the 14 poems, I guess it would be, and then I'll read you the index, the titles that make it sound. We'll see. It's a test. We'll see if that sounds like a poem. All right, but which section? Okay, here we go. I'll do this one. Uh, where does that thing start? All right, so yeah, I'm just going to read from this section and then we can talk. American Sonnet for My Past and Future Assassin. Glad someone shot, deserved to be shot, finally, George Wallace. After you send your basket of bombs and berries for the girls the bombed buried in Birmingham, after you add your palms to the psalms, the palm-covered caskets of the girls, the bomb buried in Birmingham, I'll muster a pinch of prayer for you. <laughs> you are the blind protagonist of a story that begins, in my previous life, my work involved returning runaway slaves to slavery. <laughs> <laughs> it ain't that damn funny now. And ends with the image of a black nurse pushing your old ass in a wheelchair. Can you guess what black folk passing empty cotton fields feel, George Wallace? I damn you with the opposite of that feeling. 
I keep thinking I'm confessing for the first time the reason I fear you, and you keep asking while I'm telling, why I'm telling this old story again. All right. Okay, I ain't read these things yet without getting a little bit dewy, so we'll get warmed up. All right. <clears throat> American signing for my past and future assassin. You have a gun, but to use the bullet, you decide your wife, having snuggled it under her tongue, should then smuggle it into your pie hole, but then she swallows it. You have a gun, but to use the poison, you have your son dip a rose in venom so strong the smell alone will kill someone, but the first to die smelling it is your son. You have a gun, but to use the dagger, you decide your daughter should dangle it beneath her dress. She refuses to endanger her self-respect. You need to find goons, wranglers, wire, gin, ingenuity, cotton gins. You need the Constitution. You have a gun. American sonnet for my past and future assassin. Where I am nowhere near a ledge or knife covered in a corridor of fever, colored carpet, or catching rain bead upon the morning headlights, hungering some crash to crack and blacken, blacken me before a train full of women with nose rings and thigh boots, the curved ass of a mother with her toddler, and the rain still following the hills and shoulders of parts of Maryland and New Jersey, and the oncoming trains passing inches from head on, headlong into Newark, where I almost escaped this path, before remembering the thrill coloring even today's melancholy delay. Asleep, awake, the wild-haired woman smiling on the stairs before fading, a song in the ear, like the broken phone booth I passed in the village beside a puddle of what could have been crushed tomatoes. American sonnet for my past and future assassin. Actually, you know what I'm gonna tell you? This is a secret for y'all to know. I was actually just thinking about OJ and alibis with this one. Uh, but it's also one of the ones I was like, should I put this in a book? Nobody's gonna know what I'm doing. So there you go. American sonnet for my past and future assassin. I cut myself on some glass in the water. I was out driving around the stars. I was chopping wood out back. I was at the arbitrar, I was at the abattoir grabbing a snack. I was grabbing my phone in the truck. I was smoking below the boat deck. I was practicing electric guitar. I was listening to aspiring laughter. I was on the toilet with the magazine. I was home awaiting a limousine. I was bargaining with the mortician. I was laying a great foundation. I was practicing trumpet underwater. I was grinding my hooves to nails. American sonnet from my past and future assassin. When MLK was shot, his blood changed to change wherever it hit the floor. Like others, Jackson and Abernathy gathered a few of the coins for themselves a few sank into the pockets of the detectives and forensic scientists, reporters. A maid sold the penny she found for a pretty penny on the black market. It is in the display case beside the bullets Du Bois kept in the gun under his bed. Bird got so high on horn, he disappeared. X grew large as a 300-year-old tree colonizing the landscape. In the game of chicken, Two drivers speed towards each other, and if the one who is chicken does not swerve, both drivers may die in the crash. This country is mine as much as an orphan's house is his. Okay. American sonnet for my past and future assassin. Later, the white boy we once beat like a drum died after crashing his Camaro around a bend off Shop Road. He was an asshole. Ask the baby black boys he bullied at Robert E. Lee Middle School, where the Robert E. Lee statue was painted white so often over the years, it looked like someone covered in a sheet of glue. I would not have liked to attend a middle school named after Emmett Till, or for that matter, any murdered black person. When I was the age of Emmett Till, I reckoned MLK was an old man at the age he was killed. I am old enough now to know the drum 
Though beaten, it's not an instrument of violence, nor is a banjo or whistle. I'm sorry I missed that white boy's funeral. <laughs> American sonnet for my past and future assassin. It was discovered the best way to combat sadness was to make your sadness a door or make it an envelope of wireless chatter or wires pulled from the, tape, from the radio tape recorder your mother bought you for Christmas in 1984. If you think a hammer is the only way to hammer a nail, you ain't thought of the nail correctly. My problem was I decided to make myself a poem. It made me sweat in private selfishly. It made me bleed, bleep, and weep for health. As a poem, I could show my children the man I dreamed I was, my mother and fathers, my brothers, the lovers I lost. Just mourning as a poem, I asked myself if I was going to weep today. Let me see how many more we got. One, two, three, four. That's a lot. I don't know if I'm going to be able to. Okay. All right. We'll keep going. <laughs> American sonnet for my past and future assassin. But there never was a black male hysteria, as if being called a nigger never makes you disappear, as if the fear of other people never makes you levitate, as if the nuzzle of a bullet can't poke a hole in your breath, as if you cannot drink from the river when into the river you disappear and water floods the hole in your breath. You make shit, you piss, you calculate mistakes, you can turn stone into metal, you are able to breathe wind. Air touches your skin like medicine and you disappear. It's crazy. It's as if you are not being hunted by hysteria. It's as if your death is never death. You appear, you appear to disappear, you disappear. All right, American sign up for my past and future assassin. In a parallel world where all the Doctor Who's are black, I'm the doctor who knows no God is more powerful than time. In a parallel world where all the doctors who are black see cops box black boys in cop cars and caskets, I'm the doctor who blacks out whenever he sees a police box. In a parallel world where doctors who box cops in caskets cry doing their jobs, I disappear inside a skull that's larger on the inside. Question, if in a parallel world where every doctor who was black, you were the complex time lord, when and where would you explore? My answer is a brother has to know how to time travel and doctor himself when a knee or shoe stalls against his neck. How y'all doing? We all right? American sign up for my past and future assassin. Overaged, over grave, overlooked brother seeks adjoining variable female structure covered in chocolate, cinnamon, molasses, freckled, sandy, or sunset colored flesh, expressively motored by a blend of intellectual fat and muscle while several complex and simple emotional frequencies pulse along her veins must be a careful and moderately self-indulgent cinematographer, <laughs> modestly self-conscious, reasonably self-important, spiritually self-educated, marginally self-destructive, <laughs> must be willing to raise orchids or kids in a land of assassin, <laughs> willing to wield a fluid expression in the war her lover wages against himself and the silver tongue in the war we wage against death. Y'all, you know what, I think I'm gonna stop. I mean, I had a plan here, but I'm getting so hot up here. <laughs> so I'll just read one more. So the plan was to read like whatever that is, 14 or 15, but I'm like, that's a lot of poems, especially when the air ain't working that great. And then, um, so you know what I'll do? I'll, what, yeah, I, I'll still read the last one, so two more. I'll read just one more. That means there's gonna be three missing, but you'll get the first line of them. So and you got the book now. <laughs> so I shouldn't have to be reading that much anyway. All right, um, so two more. American sonnet for my past and future assassin. I remember my sister's last hurrah. 
She joined all the black people I'm tired of losing. All the dead from parts of Florida, Ferguson, Brooklyn, Charleston, Cleveland, Chicago, Baltimore, wherever the names alive are like the names in graves. I am someone with a good memory and better imagination. Can we really be friends if we don't believe in the same things, assassin? Probably ghosts are allergic to us. Because we are dust, don't you and I share a loss? Don't we belong together, brother, sweetness, sweetness, sweetness? Poor, ragged heart, blind, savage heart. I've almost grown tired of talking to you. So yeah, next time I'll do the whole thing. But so here's the index, missing a few lines. Glad someone shot, deserved to be shot finally. You have a gun, but to use the bullet when I am nowhere near a ledge or a knife covered, I cut myself on some glass in the water. When MLK was shot, his blood changed to change. Later, the white boy we once beat like a drum, it was discovered the best way to combat. But there never was a black male hysteria. In a parallel world, we're all doctors who's overaged, overgrave, overlooked brother. I only intend to send word to my future. In the saddest part of the story, the brother says, I remember my sister's last Sarah. When I am close enough, I am reminded. All right. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, there we go. I was supposed to read one of your poems for us to talk about. It doesn't matter. But it ain't in the book, so I don't know if. Uh, you don't have to. Let's just I soldier on. Let's soldier on. All right, we'll see. We'll see. We're going off book, y'all. Um, what you want to talk about? What do we want to talk about? I was. Uh, I was always interested in the fact, of course, hey, how are you? I was always interested in the fact that, um, that you started off in slam poetry, right? Uh, I knew some rappers, yeah. So, I mean, it was the 90s, so that was pretty much anything, every, everybody was doing that. Also called just coffee shop readings. Uh, but yeah, there was and money how sometimes. Old, how old were you? Uh, early 20s, yeah. I mean, because, you know, I was in the South and playing basketball, and nobody was doing, like, open mic readings, but when I got to Pittsburgh for graduate school, certainly uh, the middle ground between basketball friends and poetry MFA students would be open mic. It would be spoken word. You know, there's a little bit of a sport element to it. They're still doing poetry. So yes, I did find uh, that was a safer community, although they always would say to me, um, why do you always get that book? You know, it's gotta be memorized. It's not really spoken word if you don't memorize it. And I would be like, that's my shield, man. I mean, first of all, I want people to know that I wrote something down, so I don't want to memorize it. But also, it's a good place to hide. So, so I never was fully spoken word. Why poet. do you think you weren't? Why do you think, what, uh, so you're saying, I mean, what you're talking about is in the performance part of it. But, you're, but you also were drawn Ah, so it sounds like it was more of a social thing. I thought yeah, it was yeah, like it was. An, I thought it was an aesthetic. No, thing. no. Uh, I mean, it is an oral thing. That's what we were talking about. I think we should certainly talk about that. But I always say, um, you know, like it's not that hard to be in the oral tradition if you grow up black. The question would be if that's true if you just grow up southern. So certainly, I like think my it, first. I think in the south. Yeah, like you go to church and you're sort of getting something like oral poetry, you know, oral performance. So no, it was more social in the in the. Uh, in the North, but it was because of like, maybe being a Southerner already having a, a kind of appreciation for orality. So you never made a decision like, I'm gonna do this for the page and I'm not gonna do this anymore. You never crossed over. There was no moment where you rose up and said, I wanna be able to send these pages out in the world without me standing up behind them. So I, see, this is why I got you here, because I'm gonna say very quickly no, and then I'm gonna say, how about you? You're asking me that question, like maybe you're thinking something. So how about you? Did you feel like you No, I did. No, I did, now that so we can get to what's really important, yeah, which yeah. is me. Yeah, that's why I got you here. You're supposed uh, to be saving yeah. me, oh, not I'm asking sorry, me all I'm these sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, yeah. no, because I started off in a poetry workshop with a, when I was like uh, 20, with a guy named Etheridge Knight, who's a great, poet yeah yeah 
and he had this poetry workshop called the Free People's Poetry Workshop. And one of the things we did was we would have to take the subway to 116th Street and just stand on the street one after another reading your poems. And you realize very quickly how exactly how boring you are. <laughs> when people are going to and from their jobs and, and, uh, and then we would go in bars and like do stuff. And I think Etheridge was a very, was big and barrel chested and he had a deep voice and he was from Mississippi and he had that Mississippi thing. Um, but I think it, I think it, yeah, no, I think at a certain point I didn't want to have to go with the poems into the, across the planet. I wanted the poems to, I wanted to find a way to communicate whatever it was I was trying to do just on the page. So now we're having fun because I'm going to ask you questions. So okay. the question is, if that's how you come out into poetry, and what I know about this book, even from the Dean Young poem, and what I know about, we should talk, certainly we should give a shout out to Philip Roth and Lucy Brock Brodo, also people who are your friends. If I say for me, like I think poetry was always so private, so no one really knew I was doing it. So I still think of it as an essentially solitary act. So even in workshops, I had trouble with like, I actually don't want anybody to fix my poem. Like, who wouldn't want to be working on a bad poem for a year? As opposed to like, <laughs> I mean, that's how I think. You know, that's that's my work. It's not your work. So I always had trouble with that inside the workshop because I didn't take my first one until I was, you know. 21 or two, I hadn't really done it in college or anywhere else. So the solitary act is still essential to me. So I, I, I do have community, Kavi Khanum, my students, but I'm really thinking about your relationship. So I like Philip Roth and Etheridge, as you said, Dean, myself, like how you see community, which is what you said to me. It sounds like it's social. Can you tell me how community influences your sense of being a poet or a writer in general? Um, I think that, I mean, in a way that workshop, which was full of crazy people. I mean, people, you know, it was full of crazy people. I mean, I was just one of many crazy people are in that. I mean, Marilyn Nelson was in, the, was in that workshop. Um, was David Wojohn in that David one? Wojohn was in that workshop. So, um, uh, But you hear what I'm saying? Like, if that's how you come into poetry, it seems like no, you've then, maintained that. No, then I think I went into a hole for like, I don't know, 15 years or something. Uh -huh. But I was, uh, I was also an idiot. I mean, I, I felt like I, I uh, dropped out of high school, I dropped out of college, so I didn't play well with others, and I was having a hard time finishing, finishing things. I mean, you always did, like, you, you had that sports thing I always think of. Like, you had that, you know, get it all done thing, or, you know, you, you didn't drop out of stuff. But see, this is also what I wanted to talk to you about, which is just, again, survival. There's a poem in the book for uh, David Foster Wallace, for him, after him. I think it's for him, slash Milos. So, like the elegiac in it. So I would say, um, yeah, the poems are just for like you know surviving. Like I'm, if I don't do them, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump out a window or something like that. So that's survival, resilience, uh, the struggle. That's in the last. What does he say in the last poem in your first book? Um, Last line of that poem, uh, hello, little squirrel. Oh, no, yeah, I honor your struggle, yeah, little brother. That's right, I honor your but struggle, But it was also, brother. it was just, you know, there, there are people you know in your life who would talk to a squirrel that you would think they were being assholes. <laughs> you know, you would just say, shut up. You know, but he was like, I honor your struggle, little brother. But he said it so sincerely. I, I felt like he, he really saw him, and uh, he saw the animal dying, and it meant something to him. In a, in a way, for me, it was just like I thought, food. <laughs> but then you put it in a poem, so obviously you could hear. No, I heard there's it. There's something I, in that line. That I found it. To, I found it moving. It was right, moving yeah. to me. And it's the first poem in the book, so I think it does say something about like honoring the struggle. But but yeah, also I feel like the the person that's most privileged in this room, the person who has the easiest time in this room, or the best shoes, or whatever, goes. Your shoes ain't better than my shoes. Man. But no, I hear you. No, your I hear shoes you. are pretty yeah, good. Yeah, I know they are. So, so um, yeah, no, you know, that's right. Like, yeah, I mean, um, I don't know if those things, one thing cancels out the other. If no, we're but, just talking about but like I mean, the I spiritual think that, struggle, I just emotional think, struggle. No, I think we all suffer the torments of the damned, being mm -hmm. alive, just being alive. Mm -hmm. But, you know, yeah, I mean, I think it is survival. But I always thought in your poems, like, I thought you were actually talking to George Wallace. Mm -hmm. Like you're, we're eavesdropping on you talking to George Wallace. Right. But you're not, it's not a, 
it's not a trope or a game. I felt like you had something to say to him. So yeah, I mean, you know, the or is that the, am I being no, no, you're too right. literal? No, you're right because because those poems have addressed, you know, with old dirty bastard, fill in the blank, MLK, right. whomever, some guy you play, played ball with in school. Right. So I'm trying to both like say stuff that I think people want to hear and also talk to you at the same time. So I'm like between the lines stuff here. So what I will say is like organizing the book. All I decided to do was to see if I could create a kind of five sonnets out of what I had already written from the 70. So therefore, it's not like alphabetical, it's not organized in the way that I wrote them. And yet, because I did that, themes do emerge or ideas that I was thinking, I must have been thinking that, but I just forgot it as soon as I sent the book off. So like reading those poems all from that same section and hearing like bullets and violence and feeling like the other day I was reading somewhere and I, I didn't do that, I was bouncing around and I felt like, you know, Jesus, um, your exoskeleton is as tender as the meat of Jesus. And some other lines were sort of emerging around it. So it just sort of depends. Themes do emerge. So what I'll say to you about that one being the first, because I could decide that, right? Like if I'm organizing 70 poems to create five new sonnets, 14 line sonnets in the back, I could decide what would be the first line. So that w the George Wallace was that one. Because at the end of that, I am talking to him, but I am also talking to white people, which is to say like, I keep saying to you, you know, that was really fucked up what you did, like racism, uh, slavery, you kidnapped me, that's some awful, awful shit. And then I feel like white people are like, I know, man, you've been saying it to me for 300 years, you know? <laughs> so that's the thing with George Wallace. Like I say, every time I say to you how, why I'm afraid of you, you say, you say why are you talking, is it why still are you telling, telling me that story? Telling right. the same old and that story. is the dilemma. So there's no answer in that poem. It is an address to white power saying, yes, there is a history to account for, and saying, but you, I think you know that now. So that means you're doing it even though there's a, it's like you don't want to be separated from history. You want it to be the past. And now we're talking about Trump. You know, you want it to be both the past and the future. And so we're on this loop of constantly saying, you hurt me, you hurt me. And the, the, the perpetrator saying, I don't know what you're talking about, and then slapping you. What are you talking about? And then slapping you. And you know, so it's the kind of weird loop. So anyway, so the poem with the guns and these other things, like the dilemma of you got this gun, but you still need all this other stuff to really account for your power. And so that's a, again, a sort of endless loop that doesn't close off. So yeah, talking to him, but he also represents a conversation for really everybody, anybody in that power dynamic. It's not just George Wallace, everybody's saying, why are we still talking about this? And you're like, well, look around. I mean, if conversation's still being had, I don't know what the answer to that conversation is or the end of that conversation is. Super heavy. I don't either, obviously. Or I, you know. How long are we supposed to talk before we start doing Q&A? <laughs> I don't know, they can decide. What do y'all want to do? I don't know, I feel like we, we, I don't know where I am. I just was in the weeds on that one, so. I was gonna ask you one more, sure. one or two more questions. Don't y'all yeah. wanna do Q&A? Don't y'all wanna ask Terrence some questions? Let's stop Perhaps, or we me. can stop. I mean, my answer to everything, I got two answers to readings. Number one, if you got questions, that means I failed because the poem should answer all your questions. <laughs> and then number two, I wrote the poem so I wouldn't have to answer any questions. Like, <laughs> the poems are themselves questions. They are speculation, so it's redundant to still be talk that's generally how I feel but you know I know it's business and so here I am you gotta fake that you like this better than you're doing you gotta you gotta you gotta like get up behind it and uh and the sweat me, gives and it away it. like if I could be cool through it but once you I are sweating, cool you know, you're not sweating I, I'm not now I got my handkerchief but anyway okay what's your question my no my question was um you were trying to teach yourself to play jazz piano at one point. What, what, that was like 10, 15 years, 12 years ago, is that, is yeah, that it's right? It's been about 20 that I've been doing it. Mm, so I have, I have a piano. So the joke is, uh, I mean, it's not a joke, it's true, but people think it's a joke. I can only play like when nobody's listening. So that means in order for me to really play it, I have to like, you know, have earphones on or, or, or my digital one that I have or play in the dark or play at night when nobody's around because as soon as someone comes in, I think there's a metaphor for the creative act with this too. Are we, I, are we getting a, do we see, feel a theme here you know, about I young Terrence? Being watched, I can't really do it. I'm like listening to somebody listen to me and that distracts me from playing. So yeah, I do, I play uh, on a, you know, on a good week, I probably play an hour a day and that's been true for about 20 years. But you also draw. And after 20 years, I can fool you for five minutes. So I'm not suggesting that I could play the piano. I want to say that before we move on. Like I, only for about five minutes would you think, wow, he's good. And you'd be like, wait a minute. 
So, uh, and I was like, okay, 20 years of trying to teach yourself how to play it, that works. Um, but yeah, I draw for a similar, similar no, reason. No, but you don't just draw, you take life drawing classes. You do it in a very disciplined way. I mean, mm -hmm. I draw, but I mean, you draw like twice a week? You go to yeah, an art two class? Or three, yeah, uh, for Wednesdays, how long? Wednesdays, Mondays. I did Sunday this week. This week I did so Saturday, So two or three days Sunday, a week for Monday. four or five hours? But you know why, though? It no, gets me I don't. Out, it That's gets me out I'm of asking. the house. I mean, <laughs> otherwise I'd just be in the house writing all the time, you know? And so um, I need exercise. And there's various ways one could get exercise. So I have decided the best way for me is like to do figure drawing because it's usually a new woman. I mean, not as exciting when it's a new dude, but I'll stay. But uh, <laughs> new woman, uh, it's quiet. Uh, nobody like talks to me. Uh, I don't have to talk to anybody. And it's like, you know, it's three hours. But the primary thing is that like it's uh, it takes me 30 minutes. I walk by here to get up there. It's right up in Union Square. So I uh, in Gramercy Park. So I do don't don't come, though. Somebody did show up. Uh, <laughs> Last summer, a guy did show up and was like, we went to college together. And anyway, it's another story. It was a semi Did any of those things feed the writing? I think it's separate. I mean, because I only really can think. I mean, everything else is really poetry. That's all I really know how to talk about, which, you know, could be terrible in a relationship. And I could say, like, probably. Uh, so everything for me is always, like, saying I decided to make myself a poem and one of the poems I read. That's kind of how I think about it. Everything is material, every relationship, every interaction, everything on the radio, everything in my earphones. So to not have that be the case all the time, I usually have to have some other distraction. I mean, it used to be family, and now it's like, okay, the distraction from taking a break coming up for air a little bit would be going to a drawing class or sitting on the piano. Uh, that's so it. So it's really to stop the poems coming out of your head. Do you realize yeah. that a lot of us actually grunt and sweat and like have to you know, fight our way to uh, the page, and you're trying uh, to keep that me stuff too, tamped yeah. down? Yeah, me too. I just think it's healthy is all. You know what I mean? So, I mean, again, it's so funny that that was just in that section, because I could think about what's going on in that poem, too. Uh, the thing I say, too, about people, like I've come up with a few things, having done this, you know, just getting started with this little book tour thing, is like, well, you know, they're... The poems, it can't be me in the poems, because they're poems. It's just like a photograph, ain't you? If somebody takes a picture of you, you look at it, and you're like, that ain't me, that's a photograph of me. So that's my relationship to the poems, but it's a kind of defense, so that I don't have to think too closely about what that eye is in them. But I will say, having said that, a lot of the stuff, that eye is, you know, it's a mirror of me, at least. And These so, all feel very, per this feels sure. as personal a book as one you've written. I think it is. And it's, the trick was, if I, I decided if I called them all the same title, I could really hide stuff. So people like have said to me, why don't you ain't number them? Or where is that poem? And I actually don't want you to find it. I want you to hear me say something <laughs> super vulnerable, and then you lose it. And then I'll be like, I never said that. What are you talking about? And so, <laughs> so that also means like subject is gone. I just like, OK, this is the poem I'm going to write today. Who's trying to kill me today? And then sometimes it's you know, personal and sometimes it's political. So it was just a good way to be super personal by not being very personal with the individual titles. All right, I, I think we ought to have Q&A. Let's do it, let's do it. Q&A, y'all have questions? If you've got a question, just raise your hand and I will do my best to bring you a mic. No pressure, I know the first See, that one. That means we did a good tough. job. Didn't that no means questions. we told him everything that we put conceivably know. She could read some more. You want to read some more? I'll read some more. That's also, that's a question. Can you read some more, Mary? Not me. I miss also appearing. Yeah, that's what I brought Is it cool today. if I ask one? It's really simple. Oh, wait. Um, in revising your poems, because like with writing, we always have to revise, um, what surprised you about like what you had to cut and what you had to like expand on? Interesting question, because my normal habit, and again, I would ask, you know, uh, pass this question on to Mary, too, is really, uh, again, obsessive. So when I, I mean, people laugh when I say this stuff, but, you know, it's real. So, like, if I say to you, I, revision was so exciting to me because it meant I was always going to be working on something. So right before I started doing these signings, I had written like a 12, 1200 word poem about my Frederick Douglass t-shirt, and I was like, okay, that's too much. <laughs> so... And I had been trying to see if I could do it. So I must have worked on that poem three years, and it was just fun every day. If I'm like piano, taking breaks from stuff. So my habit is not to necessarily want to fix things, but to revise, to keep seeing things, is certainly what I'm interested in. So one of the poems, you know, the truth has six sides to it. So I'm always, if I think of the world like that, that can be pretty time consuming. So you're just trying to get all these angles on poems. So that's my normal way. 
But for this one to just do something different and to see what it would look like to not be that kind of person, I didn't revise these. I wrote them and then I started just sending them out to keep from revising them. So that's why they kept showing up. It, it seems like a really good idea now to have been sending them out for the last year, but it was really me not wanting to go back to them. Problem is, so then my editor saw, you know, I talked about it. He was like, I was going to go for four years, hopefully not eight, but I was like, I, this is the only way I'm coping. Like, this is how I'm dealing with America we're living in. And then so my editor was like, oh, I think you got enough. You don't need to go for four years to get a book, you know. So I'm like, all right. So here you go. You have the book. I was stuck for a minute even once I sent it off because I, it was a practice. It wasn't a book. It was a way of coping, if you follow what I'm saying. Yeah. But then when I started putting them together for the book and organizing them, I was tempted to go back into them with my normal obsessive revision self. And what I, what I have decided is that I will have to live with some of those mistakes because I actually think it would have been better to maintain that all the way through, no matter how embarrassing it was or no how uncomfortable I was. But I did go back, oh, I'll just get up under the hood a little bit. Uh, I'm going to change that. And so a couple I combined, and some poems never made it. So even the, the, the abattoir kind of OJ poem, I was on the fence about that one. So I'm suggesting it was just more about changing up a pattern more than maintaining any kind of real sense of revision. So. Uh, so but this that's is the different yield of that. from you, because normally you revise and revise and revise. Yeah, yeah. So I had to, if I had a problem in a poem, if, the, if I knew the poem wasn't right on that day, I would try to write it again the next day. So even like the black male hysteria keeps coming up because I could never get it in one poem, really. I kept thinking about what that is. What does it mean that there was never any black male hysteria? So maybe there's six in the book, but that's six drafts of the same idea. Right. But I, then I thought when I was putting it together, oh, okay, sure, I'll just, I'll put them all in there. But then I was like, okay, not all of them are great because obviously they're, if I had gotten it right, I would only written one. So I had to make that decision. Will I let them be imperfect and go in and have a thread or will I revise them? And that's, I believe that's where my trouble came. So, I mean, you should still get the book. I mean, I could be wrong, but I just, if I'm wrong, I can imagine people saying, I saw this poem online and there's, there's a better version than the one that's in the book. <laughs> And what I will say is like, you know what, I, I will live with that mistake. I mean, I did 80% maybe of what I wanted to do, which was to not revise. If you want to be a nerd, I would say that's like the Elizabeth Bishop kind of thing. Like Elizabeth Bishop revised for like 10 years. Her books came no, out no, every no, 10 No, 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 no. I mean, the Moose poem was 25 years. Yeah, right. So you know what? Here we go. And this is kind of going to a question to you. But we don't really know who Elizabeth Bishop is. The lesbian stuff, the alcoholism anything else because she revised those poems so perfectly that she's out of them. So they're great poems, but they're, it's a 10, year of, 10 years of her working on a mask. So it's a beautiful mask, but it ain't really her. And so I struggle with that. I would rather have a beautiful mask than you see like scars and shit that, you know, that you're trying to smooth out. But in this book, I feel like you do see some of those scars. But my tendency would be to like get you a really, really nice mask that almost looks like me. And you did that in a way with the last book. Yeah, all I would of them. I would yeah. say the How to Be Drawn. I don't know if any of y'all have read that book, but it's a very, feels very honed and polished. And this feels. What's your revision process? Oh, it's so sad. Compared to what you just said, it's kind of a little bit on the pathetic side. I just get up in the morning, I think, I wrote something really good yesterday, but look, now there's someone who sneaked in in the night <laughs> and replaced it with this horse hockey. <laughs> and, uh, and so I, I back up and I run really hard against the wall, head first. I just revise and revise and revise and revise and revise. I was in a writing group with Sarah Paley, who's here. Don't I revise and revise and revise? Yeah, no, I revise like a crazy person. I actually a asked an editor of mine once, how much more do I revise than other people? She said, she paused, and then she said, 800%. Mm -hmm. So I, you know. But what would that look like to not revise? Or if you, since you're a person I know who exactly does what multi, it would look like. multi genres, do you revise the same in your fiction as you do in your po on your prose, nonfiction as you do in your poetry? Uh, do I revise the same? Is it the same strategy, same duration, same intensity? It, it kind of is. It kind of is. But usually with the with the prose, I have a deadline, mm -hmm. and they and they uh, get interested in that. So no, I mean. I was going to say something really smart about it. <laughs> oh, I know exactly what it'd be if I didn't revise. I, every poem starts out, I am sad. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay, though. The End by Mary Carr. I mean, like, that's the whole thing. 
And then I try to get more, a little more specific. <laughs> like, I'm not entirely sad, you know, like I could use a ho-ho or something. <laughs> I think of something. You know. So again, I, I Oh, I wanted you to talk about too. Wanda Coleman. I will, I will. Because she's connected, maybe I can transition to this comment. It's just like what you're saying. Like, I, I thought of revision when I was thinking about the assassin. So I wanted to be able to see these forces that are trying to take us out as diversely and deeply as possible so that I could get to a place where I would say, oh, this white kid, me and my friends beat up because he used to bully black kids in school. You know, he certainly deserved it. And yet, when I heard he was dead, I'm like, man, I'm sorry I didn't go to his funeral. So still trying to think about even that around the enemy. But on the other side of that, though, I am sad, like certainly if I'm not fixing that to say I'm not that sad, then that is what you get. So I do find like a lot of these poems, this is again where the sweat comes from, are, are saying that. They just, because that is maybe the first comment. So I'm sort of trying to, I'm trying to determine still, like if that's right, you know, that obsession with that. You know, so this is why we're talking about survival and struggle, but like, sure, can you just say you're sad or do you have to be like, I'm sad and a little bit happy too, or I'm sad and it's not that bad. You know what I mean? Like I'm thinking, is that what revision really is? Is revision getting you closer to seeing a thing or is it getting you further from seeing a thing? Best word, best thought, in that the beats? Yeah, but they, who reads them? I mean, I can't Ginsburg. read that. Yeah, Kerouac. not all of it. Not no, all of I mean, it. yeah, I don't like Kerouac. Either. No, I don't mean it. So say that in strength. So yeah, I think so, we answered that question. First word, yes. best word. Let's don't read it. Yeah, okay, then maybe yeah. we should revise. I'm just, I mean, so for me again, unless for Terrence, the poems are, you know, there are questions. So like, it's always a question. That's a question that I'm asking. It's not a statement. Like, what will happen if I don't revise? out of that sadness into some other space. So this is what happens. And then I say, oh, I'm so embarrassed, man. Can I be doing this for a year? Can I be going out reading this book, sweating and freaking out every time? Because <laughs> essentially it is so naked. What if you didn't sweat and freak out? Uh, that's what I have never done before. Like in other books, I revise that out of it. So the other books are fine. I think I've done okay before this book. But that's me still like putting on a really good outfit that I've like stitched together and made sure everything is right where it's supposed to be and then everybody sees it and they're cool with that. So that goes back to the impulse, even getting them all in front of me, uh, you know, 200 or so, and deciding like, where am I in these poems? And then, so I, I guess I will say, as, at some point well, I probably will start sweating. Or, you're more Orpheus than Sylvia Plath. I'm just gonna go out on a limb. Sure, sure. I, I, you know, that's one of the questions too. Like, I just got really interested in Eurydice and thinking about where she is in that. So there's your Wanda Coleman, um, thinking about the influence of someone like the wildness of someone like Wanda Coleman. Because Wanda Do Coleman too. You guys too, know who Wanda Coleman is? She second. She well, she used to be in a workshop with Charles Bukowski. So if Charles Bukowski was a black woman from Watts, you know, <laughs> single mother who worked for the soap operas and was a bartender and. Uh, said terrible things about Maya Angelou, then he would be Wanda Coleman. So, but she was a friend and she was wild and she has these American sonnets. They're everywhere uh, throughout her, at least she started in the 90s and kept writing them. And then, you know, she, I, this story, you can find this story anywhere because I've been telling it everywhere. But what I'll say about her though is me, again, thinking about like whatever Eurydice is in that story, whatever symbol she is for women, if we say that Orpheus is the symbol for the male poet, I just started thinking about like, well, maybe she's the poet. She's the one that's like, turns around and goes back to her room. He goes out and like dances with, you know, lesbians and you got a liar and he like having a great time. And so I'm like, well, I mean, that's a, that's a fun life for a poet, but maybe she's- No, I think the story is a woman has to go to hell to be with a man. It's just, but I'm a, heterose I'm a heterosexual sure, woman sure. in America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but then he gets, it's just, the idea that the poet is the one who gets free. I know, free. so a little grumbling from the people opposite <laughs> my gender. That's okay. Not y'all. Well, Not you look, guys. I'm trying to make her more complicated is all. I just have been thinking about, yeah, Wanda, uh, Eurydice, they, you know, they come up. So it's just that kind of, uh, there's other poems. I didn't read them, so I can't really, I don't want to talk about them too much, I guess. Y'all just can look at them. But there's a few questions, like this line that's in the book, um, Prince proves that a real man has a beautiful woman in him. So that idea too of still trying to get it there, I, I believe that that's true. Like that's what, I mean, we didn't know it in the 80s, like what was, what is Prince? But now we know that so much of what he is is proof that like you must have a woman inside you to really be a real man. So that's me working that out across here, the Here, here. So that's- uh, I love hearing that. Eurydice, Wanda's intensity. So again, some of those questions are like backstage questions, they're not, under the hood questions, but certainly uh, she's there, her intensity's there. Q&A questions? 
Time for maybe one more. <laughs> I'm thinking about, um, I guess, books of poetry as, I guess, items of you know sculptures. And I'm wondering, like, since you didn't have, don't have them numbered and, and all that. Uh, it kind of like loses, like you mentioned before, of like them going back to exactly where they remember that one line, right? Mm -hmm. So now the thing is, uh, does does that mean that like books are, I guess, meant to be shelved? But are you kind of like looking at books as slotted like disc in terms like when you're listening to things? Are you the way that you include the oral tradition of like hearing it, not necessarily being able to go exactly to that one moment that you remember? Uh, but what place do you? envision books to be in people's homes and how they're interacting with them in terms of like, like something that they're just uh, going through as they're living their lives or is this something that they're supposed to like, uh, in, like look at and understand academically and like look at, you know. That's good, uh, cause Mary, you said something about that, like reading it like a bouncing around, that's a good question. Ngozi, the great poet. Um, so let me, let me talk like writerly about that. Like I would not want to be a prose writer or a novelist because you wouldn't want to get like super deep. Actually reading it, I feel the same way. Like if you read half a novel and a, or the last third of it is terrible, that's so infuriating, infuriating. Like, man, I really invested some time in this to find out that it's not going to be worthwhile. So that would be true too for the writer. But for the poet, I think, you know, you can bounce around in a book of poems and one or two bad poems is not a deal breaker necessarily. So for what that means for me in generating the poems, to answer your question is, I'm just trying to write every day, man. I mean, I have an idea. Can I get away with like not numbering these things and giving them separate titles? And if I write two and realize it's not going to work, then I'll just do something else. So I like what this, she said, though, mm -hmm. about, I'm sorry, I love what you said, he said, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I couldn't see your face. Mm -hmm. um, I love what you said about, uh, like, it's almost like you can't go right back to the song on the record or something, or that they, that they all exist sort of at the same time, because each one begins with that idea, to me, of... There's somebody try, used to try to kill me, there's somebody going to try to kill me tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, to me, that's how I read that. I mean, you know, my pa address to my past and future assassin, right? Yeah, I mean, that's true. And I'm that, just saying. And then you keep going back to that, that moment, but everything else is sort of simultaneous, right? I'm just kind of saying I almost don't have anything to do with that. Like, all I'm trying to do is pursue a question, pursue an idea, and see how long I can do it. So the problem with this idea is that I feel like it's, I don't actually think I want to write anything else now. Like, oh, it's so, there's something in it, but I have to challenge myself in a different way, so I stop. So all the questions about whether it's on the shelf or how you guys are reading it in the generation of the poem, poetry is too hard for me to be like, maybe nobody's going to understand this, you know. So I'll just explore it and then I'll come out and I'll read them around. And that's one of the ways I still revise is to be testing them. You know, I've tested them through this year. And if someone or I have a feeling that people are lost and there are poems like that in there, then those are maybe the poems I won't read out loud. But maybe when you're reading them on your couch or something, sure you have some of that, you know, maybe you'll get some of the stuff that's happening. But the final answer to that is that I, it is overwhelming for me. So if you feel a sense of being overwhelmed or like what's going on, I am trying to give you some of that because that's some of what I got. You know what I mean? That's what I was writing into. But again, short answer is I'm just trying to write every day. Uh, I can always be smart afterwards. I can make up a bunch of stuff later. About can I say the I'm thing doing. also I made up about it? Wait, please. Yes. And you can tell me if I'm being a dumbass or, or what. But that's what I mean. I, don't I really always care. thought of Dickinson. I thought of Dickinson, the idea of here's a woman who didn't get out of the house, didn't get laid, didn't have a job all things I aspire to and <laughs> me too and uh and uh no and she creates this hermetic psychological space that's where you kind of have to go into her moment and the fact that the poems the poems are all so, you know sonnets that are about as big as your hand you all we all have to go into that little you know that moment with you it's not 1200 lines Oh, see, that's brilliant because even her with the numbering of them and the ambiguities about what she wrote and when she wrote it, I like that. Like, I like those, let's call it something like a crafted mystery around the poems. So next time I give an interview, I'm going to be like, oh, well, you know what Emily Dickinson has been doing? Uh, I felt that that was part of my project. That's really why I show up for these things, so I can sound smarter. Because to go to Ngozi's point, like, certainly retrospectively, I can always sound smarter, but I don't necessarily want to be that smart when I'm just waking up every day. 
trying to find something. So, and I feel like maybe, maybe many writers feel that way, but you know, the more we talk about these things, the smarter we sound. But what I would say, and that's why I said, as the writer to other writers, I would say, I don't think you want to be too smart going in, man. I think you want to just jump in the water. If you start thinking about how you're swimming, you're going to sink. So all you're trying to do is swim. And if I extend that metaphor, oh, look, can I do a backstroke? How long can I hold my breath? These are just the daily questions of surprise. And then in this, in this pressure cooker, in this particular moment, you know, that informs it too. But then after that, sure, I can decide. I mean, obviously I could have numbered them when I wrote them all, but I thought some of that sense of being overwhelmed, some of that sense of not knowing what was coming next, some of that sense of losing track of news, losing track of information comes for me in using the same title and not numbering them. So yeah. Did I have one last question? Was one there a last question, question okay? anybody? Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, so I was wondering, um, when you, like, let's say you're, um, like, 10 years from now when you're reviewing the poems that you just got published, do you feel as pleased with them? Do you think you'll feel as pleased with them then as you do now, assuming you feel pleased with them? Do you read from your old books? I've never looked at another book. I, I've never opened a book I wrote. <laughs> never happened, except to put my sign it. Yeah, same. I really, I mean, I could use a, you know, a, it's in one of the poems, in one of the books. Uh, in the last book, it's a poem called Gentle Measures. And the speaker in the poem is like having children with every nation of women. I don't know how many nations there are, but that's whatever it is in the poem. And so, and then various things happen. But I do, I mean, I, I think of that as a metaphor because that is my relationship to the poems. Like, I'm just trying to make them and then give them a little bit of training. And then I'm like, all right, I'll see you. <laughs> I might meet you down the road, I might not, you know what I mean? So, I mean, that is my relationship to my own father, so that might have something to do with it. So, I am trying to train him up and then get him out of the house. But after that, it's the same. Like, I'm not actually You're responsible for him. those children. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I train them first. I give them some lessons, give them a little pocket change, and then and they're in the bookstores or whatever waiting for somebody to pick them up, you know? But, um, so I really so don't. Because it's, yeah. it's the next, I sort of only think about the last poem and the next poem. And so I actually have been reading, a, you know, some new poems to get away from some of the intensity of this book. Uh, I, you know, we didn't have enough time tonight for me to do something like that. But I generally, last poem and next poem, that's all I'm really trying to think about and then trying to see what'll happen. That sounds so, so nice. I'm, I'm a musician, so I have to constantly sing, sing my stuff, so I can't get away from it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can. You just, you know, it'd be a different career, but... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank you guys so much. Terrence will sign books for y'all. Thank y'all for coming. Thank you both so much. Keep it going for Terrence and Mary.